Welcome to a special episode of 13 Cubed. In this video, we're going to jump into iOS forensics. Apple iOS, that is, not Cisco iOS. You see, my plan for this channel is to expand content into many different areas, with the goal of bringing in experts from various security-related fields to share their knowledge with you. The first thing you should know is that I am definitely not a mobile forensics expert, but I collaborated with a forensics researcher named Alexis Brignoni, who wrote a tool for parsing iOS forensic artifacts. That tool is called iLeap, and it's the subject of this episode. First, let's cover the basics. iLeap stands for iOS Logs, Events, and Properties Parser. It was written by Alexis Brignoni. It's a Python 3 script that takes an iOS extraction and quickly parses out interesting artifacts for us to review. It's been successfully tested on both macOS Catalina and Windows 10. And the impetus for the creation of the tool was to provide examiners with a zero-cost, open-source option to perform iOS forensic investigations when commercial tools are not accessible or otherwise unavailable. It can be used in conjunction with other forensic suites for validation purposes. That said, iLeap does provide parsing of artifacts that are not currently supported by many other tools, which is a unique advantage. The tool is available in both a graphical user interface, or GUI, as well as a command line interface, or CLI. Now let's cover the prerequisites. Besides Python 3, of course, only two additional packages are required. The first is PySimpleGUI, which, as the name implies, is necessary to support the GUI version of iLeap. The second is Six, which is a Python 2, Python 3 compatibility library, and that supports the CLI version. Okay, so that's it for the basics. Next, we're going to jump over to a macOS Catalina VM and see the tool in action. We'll first run it, and then we'll walk through the results and understand how to interpret them. So let's get started. I'm going to be using Homebrew, which is an awesome macOS package manager, to install the necessary prerequisites for iLeap. You can learn more about this at brew.sh, which you're looking at now, and there'll be a link in the description. Let's go ahead and switch over to Terminal and use Homebrew to install a separate Python 3 environment. We'll type brew install Python 3 and then let it do its thing. Now you may be wondering, wait a minute, why are you installing Python 3 when a version already ships with Mac OS? Good question. In my experience, it is far easier to get third-party plugins and libraries to work with the Homebrew managed version of Python 3 than with the version that ships with Mac OS. Of course, your mileage may vary and you're more than welcome to try it. So while this is performing the installation and setup of this separate environment, I'll go ahead and tell you what our next step will be. We're going to switch over to Safari and grab the URL for the GitHub repo for iLeap, and then perform a git clone to pull down that repo's contents onto our desktop. So we'll give this a few more seconds to finish up and as you can see, it is now installed in user local bin Python 3. So let's clear the screen and change into our desktop, which is again the location to which we will perform the clone. We'll switch back to Safari. And you'll notice I have a second tab open here for the iLeap GitHub repo. So I'm going to click the green button here and then the little clipboard icon to grab that. And we'll go back to the terminal and type git clone and then paste in that URL. That's all there is to it to pull down the newest version. So this will only take a couple of seconds, and as you can see, it's already done. I'll change into the iLeap directory that was created, and if we do a directory listing at this point, you're going to notice a very important file called requirements.txt. Let me hide this window here so it's easier to see. And again, the requirements.txt file is going to have all of the requirements necessary to run iLeap both the GUI and the command line versions. So what I'm going to do is path to user local bin pip3, which is the Python package manager installed by Homebrew. And I will simply type install dash r requirements.txt. This will enumerate the contents of that file and go ahead and pull down all of the necessary requirements to get iLeap up and running. And when this is complete, we should be able to then run the tool. That's literally all there is to it. It does all the work for you. As you can see, it is completed. So we're going to be using the GUI version of iLeap 
in this particular demo. So I'll once again path to user local bin Python 3 using that homebrew managed version, and then I'll run iLeapGUI.py. After a few seconds, we should get the GUI window that pops up. And as you can see, it's right here. So now let's go ahead and take a look at iLeap. So below the introductory text, we have three radio options. iLeap is able to work with iOS extractions in tar, zip, and logical file system formats. For this example, let's parse a tar file created with Magnet Acquire. This is a free program used to obtain full file system extractions from jailbroken iOS devices. When selecting a tar or a zip file, the next step is to browse for that file by clicking the first browse button. So let's do that. Within my downloads directory, I have that iOS12.tar file, which was created with Magnet Acquire. It's approximately 10 gigs in size, and that's what we'll use for our demo. The second browse button will allow me to select the directory where the uncompressed extraction will be placed. All of the script output will be in a report folder in the location from which the tool is launched. I can optionally choose generate CSV output, but I'll leave that unchecked and click process. And that's it, we're off to the races. So I think you'll agree the interface is very simple and intuitive, and if I didn't explain any of that to you, I'm pretty sure you would have figured out what each option did without me even narrating it for you. Now, as of today, iLeap parses dozens of artifacts with more being added all the time, which is awesome. When this is done, we'll get a little pop-up notification that shows us the reports path. And when we click the OK button, as we'll find out, it will open Safari, which is my default web browser, and show us that output. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, in the final section of this episode, we'll go ahead and take a look at the contents of this report and see what iLeap has been able to tell us about this iOS image. Let's begin with iLeap's main screen, which is pretty self-explanatory. The case section at the top contains metadata about this particular case, including the extraction location and type, the report directory, and the time it took in seconds to process this evidence. The device info section contains metadata about the device from which the image was acquired. I've redacted some of this information for privacy reasons. The informational section contains social media links, and the about section contains the all important contributors link, which I happen to have open in this tab. It's important to note that iLeap would not be as awesome and as capable as it is without the contributions of the people listed here. They have lent their time and expertise to allow iLeap to parse a wide variety of forensic artifacts. Some of these people include Sarah Edwards, Jessica Hyde, Bill Moore, Heather Mahalik, and the list goes on and on. So be sure to check out the contributors link to learn more about them. Now back to the iLeap main page. Along the left side, you will see various categories of artifacts that were collected with this tool. I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but we will hit the highlights. I'd also like to briefly mention that the image that we used for our demo isn't exactly the most interesting thing in the world, but it does have a few things for us to take a look at to get an idea of the tool's capabilities. Let's start with accounts.html. As you may have guessed, this report will show us the accounts present on the device. This is important information that law enforcement could potentially use to subpoena a service provider for the extraction of cloud-based data. I've redacted the usernames, but you can still get a good idea as to the kind of information available in the report. If we move on down to the application state section, you'll notice a single report here called applicationstate.html. This will show us the extracted and parsed binary plist or BP list from the SQLite database that keeps track of which apps are currently installed on the device and where they're located. This is important for app analysis since the app directories are identified by a long GUID instead of the application name or bundle ID. We move on down to the data usage section. There are a couple of reports here. zprocess.html will show us the apps in use along with an associated timestamp. And zliveusage.html will show us the same information, but also includes network data. You'll notice both Wi-Fi and WAN or cellular columns. Very useful information in this particular report. Moving further down, 
let's check out the Devices Connected report, which, as the name implies, will show us the computers to which this iOS device has been connected. Also useful information. Moving further down, let's check out Icon Positions. As the name implies, this will show us how the icons were actually ordered and arranged on the screen. Each cell has a bundle ID that identifies the app. When a cell has a list with bundle IDs, it means it's a folder. The folder's name will be at the end of the list. As of the recording of this episode, this is actually an iLeap exclusive artifact. Very cool. Moving further down, notice there are quite a few reports in the Knowledge C section. These would not be possible without the important contributions of Sarah Edwards. She's done some incredible research in this particular area. I'm not going to click on every one of these, but check out App Usage. As the name implies, we can actually check out which apps were used and for how long on this particular device, which is pretty neat. And then App in Focus will actually show us how much focus time or how often that app was actually in use and in focus on the screen in seconds. If we move on down to the appactivity.html report in the Knowledge C section, we can actually see app usage and what an app was doing and where. Check out the URLs in one of the rightmost columns there. Very interesting information. Again, all of these are under the Knowledge C section. Apps Historical has a single report and this will actually parse the mobile installation logs and give us a limited timeline of apps being installed, updated, and even deleted. If I search for Musical.ly, you can actually see evidence here that TikTok was installed at some point because that's actually the bundle ID for that app. Pretty neat. And then one of the last things I'll show you is System State. This can be used to show us the device's most recent reboots. Now, as I mentioned, this is not the most interesting image in the world, but all I wanted to do was give you an idea about how easy and simple it was to run iLeap and how easy it is to interpret the results. Because the reports are in such a nice, easy to read HTML format, it becomes quite easy to click through these and get right at the information that you need very quickly. So very, very neat. We didn't even see some of the other useful things that could potentially be available here, such as Safari web history, SMS chats, WhatsApp information, iOS notifications, and the list goes on and on and on. It's also important to note that this tool is constantly being updated. So by the time you're actually watching this, there are probably other new features that aren't even incorporated here in this particular demo. So just keep that in mind. It's being constantly added to and improved as we move forward. All right, as we wrap up this episode, one last thing I wanted to show you really quickly is the script logs section. If you're looking at screenoutput.html now, which is self-explanatory, it basically shows you the status of the parsing of each artifact as the tool does its thing. But the processed files log.html is particularly interesting because it shows you the full path to where the artifacts are located. So for tar and zip files, the script will extract the file to be parsed and place it in a directory named temp at the root of the report folder. This is useful if the examiner wants to process the particular source file with other tools. The log will let the examiner know in what directory the wanted file was placed after extraction. So I just wanted to point that out. So that wraps up this special 13 cubed collaboration episode. I've been wanting to do something like this for a while, and I'm hoping to bring in other industry experts from various information security fields and share this kind of content with you. So I hope you find this very useful. As always, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing, and I will catch you in the next episode.